This is where it all began. The original elite athlete was average, at least. Let's go back in time. Tonight. Average body type. And then something extraordinary happened. Smashing the world record. Unbelievable. He's done it again. Basketball players got taller. Shot putters got larger. Gymnasts, smaller. All these highly specialized body types chasing one goal. The human limit. Like our universe, the ideal body type for different sports accelerated out from this beginning. But unlike our universe, the rate is slowing. Athletes have kind of settled into their body types, a natural artificial selection, so to speak. Even in the NBA, where we saw heights skyrocket for decades, it has plateaued recently. In fact, many believe that the 92 Dream Team would beat today's team. Thinking about this over the last few weeks, watching the Olympics, I couldn't help but wonder, are athletes still getting more athletic? Well, the atmosphere is absolutely electric. A Berlin summer night in 2009, the most fitting name in sports history gave us exactly what we craved. Set. You can't catch him. Usain Bolt, look at the turn. Absolutely There is no one on this planet or any other one that we know of that has ever run that fast. Breaking the 100 meter world record, this was a phenomenal feat, but as time has gone on, I believe that this represents something far grander than we could have appreciated at the time. It's not that it's just a world record. It's how long it stood a world record. Take a look at this real quick. It's the record for the longest record. All the way at the top is Usain Bolt, and at these Olympics, nobody was seriously close to his record. So what about other events? Are world records just standing longer now? For the men, in the 100, 200, and 400, we have only seen one world record since 2009. And for the women, we haven't seen a single world record in the sprints since the 80s. Lawrence Griffith Joyner blowing away the field. It's almost as if athletes have gotten so fast they're slowing down, at least the rate of progress. Were the peaks of the 80s and 90s just a byproduct of steroid use? What's going on here? To understand this, let's go back closer to the beginning when the elite athlete was more average. Same city, same event. Owens ended up running a 10-3 in Berlin. He set the world record by running a 10-2 earlier that year. But if he had run that this year, he wouldn't have even qualified for the Olympics. In fact, he'd get dusted by teenagers. Closed skills, such as sprinting, provide a nice glimpse into athletic progress. The measurables are very clean, and clearly here, this is a sign that we are getting faster as a species. Or is it? Let's consider a few items that were highlighted by writer David Epstein. Bolt started out of blocks, specially fabricated carpet designed to propel him forward. Owens started out of holes, holes that he dug with a gardening trowel. Not quite the same thing. Experts suggest that if he had blocks, the difference would have been roughly 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Bolt also ran on a modern day track, an embossed rubber surface that enhanced his grip with every single stride. Owens ran on ash, a cinder track, which is ash from burnt wood. That surface stole far more of his energy. And it's no coincidence that if you look at the first sub 10 in the 100 meter for the men, it was run after they moved away from these cinder tracks. Experts suggest this was another 0.15 to 0.2 seconds. Bolt also had far better shoes and training and development, but even if we don't count that, biomechanical analysis that looked at the speed of Jesse Owens' joints suggests that if they had run under the same circumstances, he wouldn't have been 14 feet behind. He would have been within one stride. There have been a few sprinters who have given us a few examples of this. 
Sean Crawford famously took on a zebra on dirt, running a 10.89 on Man vs. Beast, far below what he usually ran. Canadian 2016 bronze medalist Andre de Grasse ran on a track crafted to be similar to Owen's, and he ran an 11 flat, 1.1 seconds slower than his 9.9. So, considering an alternate universe where Owen's and Bolt were both born in 1986, this race would have been a lot closer. You can say the same thing about virtually every running event. The first four minute mile run by Sir Roger Bannister was on a cinder track as well. And you may have noticed that distance racers have been breaking records left and right. Why? Well, the shoes. And no, this is not a Nike ad. Kind of wish it was though. Um, our boy Sir Roger here was not wearing the Nike Alpha Flies. To get a better understanding of this, I spoke with the globally recognized biomechanist, Dr. Peter Weyand, the chair of kinesiology at TCU, who specializes in speed. When the advanced footwear technologies came along, all the records in for distance running, you know, the record books have been almost entirely rewritten since 2016, not because the athletes are better or the performances are, just because the shoes are better. A barrier once thought impossible is now broken. It's a form of mechanical doping, tech improvements causing records to fall, at least on land. What about in water? In the 28 individual swimming events that'll be contested in Paris, close to half of the top 10 times have been posted in the last four years. Why? Well, part of it is technology. Gutters added to the sides of pool to decrease turbulence and high-speed swimsuits that decreased friction. I am wearing the fastest suit in the world. Caused these guys' times to plummet. But even after all that technology is taken into account, the frequency of world records falling in swimming is significant in comparison to running. So why is there this difference? One simple reason. We've been runners for a long time and it's been a while since we were swimmers, at least natural full-time swimmers. At some point, you had the shift from life in water to life on land. And by the way, I put a lot of time and research into this channel, so if you're enjoying this, I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. Thanks. If it isn't painfully clear, uh, this is a very unnatural movement. And running, we've been doing it for a long time, so we've had a lot of time to perfect it. So while technology is a big contributor to development, it's not everything. And for that, we can look to the game that's grown more than any over the last century. Basketball. Take a look at the Celtics game. Bob Cousy, this is 32 years before the Dream Team. Which era do you think had better players? These games are 32 years apart, the same distance of time as the Dream Team is to us today. The difference between a 1960s player and a 1990s player is glaring. The difference between a Dream Team player and today is far less significant. Why was there such a stark contrast between the 60s and 90s, but not the 90s and today? Many factors have contributed to this. Population growth, more revenue to develop and attract more athletes, and just think of how growth works in general. When you're new to something, you tend to get better in the early stages. Bob Cousy, Bob Cousy. was literally born before the NBA existed. He was born in a period that predated racial integration in basketball. The game didn't have the same level of professional seriousness. Bob was the highest paid player ever, making $25,000 annually. Is television and radio allowed for more resources and pay? The typical NBA body type exploded into outlier territory. If you were seven feet tall and born outside of the US in 1945, you probably wouldn't have been found, at least by the NBA. That changed dramatically over a few decades. The percentage of seven footers skyrocketed. However, these bigs weren't always coveted. But that, that really emerged at the end of the, um, of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And it... That's Professor Timothy Olds, who, along with Professor Kevin Norton, published the original paper detailing this big bang of body types. 
the general philosophical principle of the, of the golden mean. In the early 1900s, physical education instructors and coaches believed that the average body type was the best for all athletics. There's a long tradition in philosophy uh, going back to Aristotle. Uh, if you look at, for example, the balance of the humors, you know, uh, you had to have the right amount of the different humors to, um, to be a, a complete person. Any departure from the norm was seen as an abnormality and therefore in some ways pathological. Perhaps better than any sport, the NBA personifies this rapid shift in belief and player talent. And this explains why we see such a contrast from the 1960s to the Dream Team. I don't even think Bob would have argued that. Sorry, Bob. Kind of roasting you. However, the comparison between the dream team and today though, is much different. Dozens of comments on my previous video, numerous former players, not really there really. is a large contingent that believes this dream team would beat the Avengers of today. It's even got its own Colin Cowherd sample. It would be grown ups against the kids and the dream team would roll. The, the, the basketball is so much better now than it's ever been. It's got its own serious schizophrenic cow herd divide and it's kind of understandable. The optics just aren't as measurably different here. I mean, they kind of are because these are action figures and it's not real life. But in real life, it's kind of hard to tell. At least on its surface, because there is a significant difference, we just have to take a step further. The human limit is not confined to tangible differences. There are strategic and skill advances that push us forward in massive ways. In my last video, I pointed to the fact that there wasn't a single player on today's Team USA who you could leave at three. On the Dream Team, there were seven. Many commenters dismissed this point, primarily stating that the Dream Team was more physical, fundamental, and that shooting isn't everything, which suggests that the best basketball players and teams existed 32 years ago. We need to clear up this confusion because once you understand a few key changes, you will hopefully realize this is not even a debate. In fact, many people on both sides are looking at this completely wrong. Schematic evolutions such as shooting more threes now versus posting up, they're more difficult to distill than Bob Cousy versus Magic Johnson. Sorry, Bob. So I wanna show you a few key changes that will hopefully put this to rest. I went back and watched a few of these Dream Team games to break it down. So after you control for the ridiculous amount of transition offense, from my count, Team USA had 91 possessions, 39 of them were transition offense possessions. What you find is very little movement and very little space. There were 19 post-up possessions in this game. That's about quadruple the NBA average today. Despite scoring 117 points, they only made five threes. For comparison purposes, the 2024 Team USA made 18 in their first game. Why are so many of these guys chucking like they're Steph Curry? <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. I guess one of them actually is Steph Curry, but what about the rest of them? What about LeBron, Embiid, Davis? Why don't they take their man down to the block like Malone, like Robinson, like Jordan did, like Barkley did? Why are they so soft? Well, they're softer because they're smarter. This isn't just my belief. This is math, I will show you. And this revolution started with a rule change, one that benefited the defense. Yes, there was a rule change after the 90s that benefited the defense, one that inadvertently pushed our human limit and created better basketball players. Before the rule change and in this Dream Team era, defenses couldn't help like they can today. They had to either double team or stick to their man, even if it was Dikembe Mutombo out there, they had to respect him. That made it easier for guys like Malone and Jordan to score in post possessions or isolations. There just wasn't as much help defense. Across the front of the rim, and he's not double teaming anybody. That's it. Rule change made post ups in isolations less effective, which is partially why you see less of them today. But more importantly, it revealed something that had been hidden in plain sight. Just take a look at this possession real quick. I'm going to pause it. Patrick will only receive two points for this shot one step inside the arc. If he had taken one step further back, he would have received three. He would have received one and a half times the points for one step back. That is not fair, but that is how basketball works. You get three behind the arc, two in front of it. And in today's NBA, 
players will make an 18 footer, which is about what this ends up being, 40% of the time. That's 0.8 points per possession. They would make a 20 and a half footer about 38% of the time. That is 1.14 points per possession. For context, the difference between the top team, the Celtics, is 1.23, and my team, unfortunately, the Blazers, is 1.08. It's not even as big of a difference here. One common misconception around this is that the NBA has gotten soft and become more of a selfish jump shooting league. Well, this isn't really accurate. Teams shoot just as many jump shots as they did in the 90s. What has changed is shot selection. Using these numbers straight from the NBA's website, even if we assumed the Dream Team was just as good at shooting, they'd be playing in a losing way. Per 100 possessions, assuming for NBA averages, it's a difference of about 10 points per game. You can throw MJ's mid-range in there, it still won't pencil out. These are the types of strategic advances that push the human limit forward. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let's go back to Owens for a second. Out of the womb, he might have been just as built for the 100 meter as both. How do we know this isn't true for our dreamers in a different way? The dream team grew up in an era where there was no development of the three because there was no three. Players are smarter and unobjectively better shooters today, largely due to this discovery. But like all advances that have pushed the human limit, that does not take away anything from previous generations. Would Pippen, Jordan, Drexler, and even the bigs have been able to develop a three? It's hard to deny they wouldn't have at least been better. And they would have had coaches telling them, I need you to take a step back. Not like in a confrontational way, like to shoot the three. So where does that leave us? Well, there have been tech advances, strategic shifts, and more athletes playing adequate sports, less new world records. Where is this limit? Where do we go from here? Personally, I find all of this exciting and simultaneously terrifying. Um, the Olympics provide us with this nice benchmark every four years, this line in the sand to see how far we've come as a species. And as humans, we will always be pushing up against that line. We will always be pushing the goalpost back. But as technology improves, there's at least one group I do not envy. And that is World Athletic Organization, the folks in charge of deciding what's legal, what's not, what is fair. At least there's some beauty in this. Um, our bodies are clearly limited, but our minds and spirits don't really seem to be. That is the human condition. That is what fuels progress. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't. Take care.